Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Paul is stuck in Caesarea uh, in his first imprisonment, his first two-year imprisonment. And, you know, he appeals to Caesar and eventually gets sent up to Caesar. But right now he writes, he writes Galatians, Ephesians, uh, well, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians we know Maybe Colossians, but we, we know Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians here. And uh, so we're doing, we, we stopped while he's in Caesarea. Uh, and uh, actually, we, we kind of blew by Caesarea. Had to back up a couple chapters in Acts to put him back in prison so we could read, you know. I just kind of blew right by it. And then, oh, we got back up. Let's go back to Caesarea and visit Paul in prison. Hallelujah. And so uh, he's in prison. We've been reading from the book of Ephesians. Now, the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians are... You know, positional truths, who we are in Christ. You know, we've been raised up with him, made to sit with him. Uh, we're, listen, we're no longer in the sin. All the things of positional truth that Paul teaches. Now, if you take Paul's teaching on positional truth and not balance it against what he writes about applicable truth, in other words, applying that truth, you get a distorted view of things. This is how people come up and say, I'm under grace, and it doesn't matter what I do because I'm under grace. I don't have to give. I don't have to tithe. I don't have to go to church. And they get that by reading simply scriptures that apply to your positional truth in Christ without the applicable truth. Paul always taught one thing. He would teach who we are, and then he would teach how to apply it. Okay? And if you don't apply it, who you are doesn't work. You have to make it applicable. You can't lay down and fornicate and drink and get drunk, carouse, run around and say it doesn't matter because I'm under grace. That's not what Paul taught. Yet they call Paul the preacher of grace. So what we're going to do now is Paul's first three chapters are that applicable truth. Uh, you know, he says, you know, that we, we are, we're in Christ where he's a, he has a prayers for the church. You know, all the, you know, we're raised up with him, made to sit with him in heavenly places. We come to chapter 4, and chapter 4 starts out with this very... Uh, bold and clear transitional scripture, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Now let me say here, this, you know, to hear some people talk, it doesn't matter how you live, yet Paul comes right back after establishing who we are in Christ, where we're seated in Christ, and says, now walk worthy of it. Yeah. It says walk worthy of it. I mean, you, you can't really uh, get a whole lot clearer than that, I don't think. And, and really, it, it means appropriately or as becometh, all right, or uh, of a godly walk God, in a godly way. So I beseech, I'm begging you that you walk worthy, that you walk appropriately, that you walk in a godly sort of godly manner of the vocation that you're called to. So now Paul says, okay, now I've established the truths, now walk worthy of it. In other words, that we are to conduct ourselves in a manner that represents what God has done in us. Not lay down and declare I'm under grace and do whatever you want to do. Now, now you think, Pastor Ed, I have had people tell me that. So I'm not making this up. I'm not just conjuncturing. They've told me. I'm under grace. It doesn't matter what I do. And I'm like, have you read the Bible? Yeah, I'm Paul the preacher of grace. You didn't read the other half of his writings. Paul the preacher of do what you're supposed to do. Not the preacher, just the preacher of grace, but the preacher of do what you're supposed to do. He, he, he preached both sides. Hallelujah. So, now here's how we're to walk it. With all loneliness and meekness and long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now, so he says we're to endeavor to keep the unity of what? The Spirit. We're not to try to have unity in the flesh. We're to have unity in the Spirit. It has to, you can't, this, this is all this, this, uh, this worldly, um, what's the word they try to use? Um, oh, gosh, I can't think of the word. The whole world uses all the time now. Re not relevance, um, where, where everybody is, you know, we have tolerance, tolerance. Tolerance is trying to keep unity in the flesh by governmental e the, uh, edict. Well, you can't do this and you can't do that because it offends this one. You know, we're not going to fly the American flag in our cafeteria because it might offend foreigners. Well, they can go home. Okay? 
I mean, that, that, that UCAL Berkeley put up, uh, they, the student union voted to not to take to remove the American flag out of the uh, student common area because it might offend their, their, national stu their international students. T-O-U-G-H. Tough. Or the, the uh, kind of slangy spelling, T-U-F-F. -F. Tough. All right? That is natural attempts at unity. We're not, see, the church tries that mess. We're, now we're trying to be, be unified with Muslims and be unified with Hindus and, you know, and not offend the Hindus or the Muslims. Now, the gospel is going to offend people who don't believe on Jesus. It's supposed to. It's supposed to cut them. Amen? Now, we're to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That means among ourselves, we're to walk in the Spirit. And if we're led by the Spirit of God, we're going to be unified in, in things of God. When you're walking with the Spirit, you're going to be unified in Spirit. Amen. That means you're always going to agree on all your doctrine. But if you know you've got the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwelling in you, you're going to be unified with other people who had that same Spirit. You're not, going to be, you're not going to be resisting them all the time. You're going, to have, you're going to have fellowship one with another in the Spirit. All right? So we're to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. And then he goes on and says this. There is one body. That is the body of Christ. There is one Spirit. That is the Holy Spirit. There's not three. There's not, there's not seven different, you know, uh, spirits of God. You don't have a different Holy Ghost. Now, the Bible refers to in the Old Testament the seven spirits of God. It's talking about the same Spirit, different aspects of the Holy Spirit. But there's not seven different Holy Ghosts. Okay, it's all the same Holy Ghost. All right? Uh, one Spirit, even as you're calling, one hope of your calling, one Lord. This does not mean that you get baptized in the name of Jesus only. You know? Uh, you got to be baptized. In the, if you're not baptized in the name of Jesus only, speaking tongues, you're not saved. Yes, I am. Okay? That one Lord, one faith, one baptism is talking about there's one Lord you get saved by. There's one name we call it. We call on the name of Jesus. Amen. But God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, Jesus recognized their existence. He said that you're to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Jesus talked about the Father. The Bible talks about the Holy Ghost coming on him. There are three persons to the Godhead. And Jesus recognized that. As a matter of fact, he prayed to the Father, him and the Father one. Then he said that he prayed that he would send the Spirit. He said, I'll pray to the Father. He'll send, he'll send the Holy Ghost or the Comforter. Go in Jerusalem, be endued with power from on high. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you'll be witnesses of me. He said he'll come, and actually when he said, I'll send another comforter, another paraclete. Actually, the Greek form there is parakletos. It's a form paraclete. But it, it means the same thing. It's, it's referring to the same thing. I'll send another comforter. The word another in the Greek means one after the same manner as myself. He was going to send, he was send one just like him called the Holy Ghost, the comforter. So Jesus acknowledged, uh, and, and we've been through this in our teaching on the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, that, tr that attributes or works that were attributed to God in the Old Testament are attributed to the Holy Ghost in New Testament writing. So the New Testament recognizes the Holy Spirit as God. And we're not going to go back and teach you on that tonight. But it's, it's out there. And so he says there's one Lord, that's Jesus, to get saved by. There's one faith. You can't have faith in Muhammad and get saved. It will not get you into heaven. That which is, you know, actually, you don't, it, when you get saved, you don't get into heaven. When you get saved, you get born again. Yes. Heaven just happens to be your, ten, your, your destination. All right? You get born again. One baptism. Now, some folks say, see, you know, everybody get baptized in the, you know, in the water in the name of Jesus. No, 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 no. There's a bat, you know, some say there's no such thing as a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Really? Wow. Really? Well, Jesus taught the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We have baptism in physical water. That's taught in the New Testament. And then we have baptism into the body of Christ. There are three New Testament baptisms. One baptism saves. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about, you know, uh, you see, people read stuff from an, and I don't mean to be ugly, but people read stuff from an ignorant standpoint. Or what people tell them it means, and they don't take any time to study themselves. He's talking here. He begins to talk about the body of Christ. And he's saying about saying there's one body. There's one spirit. You're called into one hope of your calling. One Lord. Jesus is the only Lord that saves you. You can't get saved by Lord Muhammad or, or Lord Vader. Just thought I'd throw that out there. <laughs> right. 
praise the Lord. Anyway, one faith. If you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart and God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. One baptism. Baptism in water does not save you. It is an ordinance of the church that we are to follow. It is an ordinance of the church that is a physical testimony of a spiritual event. But water baptism does not save you. You can dunk people all day long until they're waterlogged and they still not go to heaven. What saves you? Baptism into the body of Christ. Look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. See, we just need to keep our doctrine straight. And if you know the Bible, then you won't get messed up when you read scriptures like this. Verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 12, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, whether bond or free. We've all been made to drink into one Spirit. So there you have it. The Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ. So there is one baptism by which you're saved, not water baptism. You can't get baptized in the Holy Ghost until you're born again. That's a subsequent event. So it is the baptism by the Spirit into the body of Christ that saves you. Okay? One God, one Father of all who is above all, through all, and in you all. All right, so now he establishes the oneness. He's talking, remember he talks about keeping the unity of the Spirit? And he begins to go through a bunch of ones. One body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father. All right, we've got all those ones there. But take it in the proper context. Don't get off and get weird. You know? You'll have, the, you'll have people show up who don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He's just, he was a God, but not God. Oh, God, go, go get rid of your stupid Bible that you printed just to so support your doctrine. You know? The Bible, the Bible for that the group of people, they printed their own Bible and changed the article in, in John 1, which says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and their Bible says, and the Word was a God. They just, and they printed their own Bible. Because it changes the entire doctrine of the deity of Christ. Satan has always challenged the deity of Christ. If thou be God, or the Son of God, cast yourself down. If you be God, Turn these stones into bread. Okay? He's always challenged the deity of Christ. But he knew he was God because he tried to kill him from the time he was born. All right? He just didn't want anybody else to know it. That would ever be. All right. Hallelujah. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now, very interesting here. Sometimes I just get frustrated with, you know, um, the ability of people to teach stuff in a way that, that's inaccurate and people just suck it up. You know, I, mean, I, I got a beagle. Now, I can sit down at the table and we can eat, you know, whatever. You know, it doesn't matter, whatever it is. She, and she sits there at the, beside us the whole meal. Now, she knows if she makes a noise, she gets nothing. So she'll sit there. Now, she will get up and walk by and rub your leg just to let you know she's there. If you don't make eye contact, she'll get up and walk by you and rub your leg and come back and rub your leg again. Just, just gently brush against you just so you know she's there. Okay? So when we get done eating, we can pick up, we can pick up a plate and she bolts to her bowl. I mean, she is, she's going to the bowl. Oh, beagle sound. And you walk over and put it there. And I don't care what it is you put up there. She won't know what it is because she will suck it down so fast. I mean, you know, because it came from the table, and she's just going to suck it down, and she's just excited. Well, you know, a lot of Christians are that way with doctrine. The yeah. Bible talks about, that we're, you know, and we get into this in the next chapter, that we're not to be any more children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. See, stuff comes along, and it sounds good. You've got to watch stuff. I, I, any, anytime somebody teaches something, and it explodes, like, overnight as the hottest, latest, greatest, I want to sit back and judge it a little bit because in a lot of those cases, there's error in it. But people just run after it. They buy the books. They buy the tapes. They're running around talking about it. And, you know, that person is the greatest speaker everywhere. And they get, they're getting hundreds of thousands of dollars in money coming into the ministry. And then they keep bailing on it and they keep taking it. And, and that's what happened when, the, when the, the, quote, radical grace message came out. They started teaching things that were just a little off. And then people kept taking it further. And they had to take it to the next level to keep them following them. And so they took it to the next level. And it got to the point it was just crazy. 
And now we're, getting, we're, got, we're finally getting some blowback from people who have enough platform to say something. I've been saying it since it came out. This is off, the, this is off base because it's too far over here. All right? You know, way, way too far over here. And so we need to get back and stay with the Bible. We need to stay with the Word and be balanced in the Word. There may be truth or something. Listen, God, the devil is, he may be uh, brain damaged, but he's not stupid. He knows how to deceive. He is the deceiver. Now, I can tell you, I could put strychnine in my dog's food when I went over to her bowl, and she'd eat it. You know why? Because she wants that gravy or the hamburger or the mashed potatoes or the chicken. There's certain things she really loves. She likes macaroni and cheese. She likes cheese. She loves cheese. All right? We don't give her a lot. I mean, we'll give her a little bit. We just don't give her a lot. We don't, like, feed her with that. We give her a little bit. Usually in a night meal, she gets a little bit of the leftovers, a small, just enough so she can say she had some. Why? Because beagles will blow up. You'll look over there and be, you'll like four beagles and it's one. Boom, boom, boom. Little be legs hanging at the bottom. You got to watch beagles. All right? But so, so I want to say this, and I said that coming in this because it says, under every one of us is giving grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. The word grace does not simply mean undeserved, unmerited favor. As a matter of fact, that's a harder definition to find than you think it is. It means, it comes from the Greek charis. And let me, let me give you um, uh, some, some graciousness. Um, of a manner of abstract, uh, in, in concrete, literal, or figurative, or spiritual, especially the di divine influence on the heart. So grace is a divine influence on the heart. Influence. Now that doesn't necessarily mean favor. It could be influencing you to, to walk with him. But now listen, we still have a choice to make to follow it. Okay? Um, acceptable, benefit, favor, gift, gracious, joy, liberality, pleasure, and thanksworthy. That's what the word means. It doesn't just, you know, some people come along, it's, it's, his, it's uh, undeserved, unmerited favor. I had the favor of God, so it doesn't matter what I do, his favor's on me. I'm going to get money no matter what I do. And yet Paul wrote later, I mean, wrote to the church at Corinth and said this, he, that every man give according as he purposes in his own heart, you know, let him give, not begrudgingly, but cheerfully. For God loves a cheerful giver. He that soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly. He that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. Let me just add one to that. He that soweth nothing reapeth nothing. Because the principle is if you sow sparingly, your harvest is... And then he says it's every according, and every, according as every man purposes in his own heart. So however you sow is how you reap. And Paul in that chapter into the church at Corinth was referring to money. Amen. And so he says, if you sow sparingly, you're not going to get everything on you. God's just going to dump it on you no matter what because you're under his grace. He said, you're going to reap sparingly. So what you do with your money does determine how the blessings are coming to you. And, and, and it is not based on God's favors on you, and you're going to get it no matter what you do because your giving is a work. Well, I don't care if it is or not. Paul said you get according to how you give. You can call it a work. You can call it whatever you want to call it, but the Word of God says you reap according to what you sow. Why? Because it's a principle of the Word of God. God said in the law of Genesis, back over in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, he said, let every seed produce after its own kind. So, so the seed that you give is the basis on which you receive back. Be not mocked, God is not, um, I mean, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Every man, um, oh gosh. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. How you sow is the gauge by how you reap. And grace does not supersede what the scripture tells you to do. That is a violation of grace. To expect to get what the word of God tells you to do. And get, get something in violation of how the word of God tells you to get it. Because you think you're under grace. Well, see, that's because people have taken a definition of the word and misconstrued it or misapplied it or, or, and tried to shove something into scriptures that the word of God doesn't teach. 
And by doing so, they violate spiritual principle. And when you violate spiritual principle, you don't get the spiritual benefits of what you're trying to get. All right? So to every one of us is given what? A benefit, a gift, a favor, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. God has gifted you. And, and it is a grace. Whatever gift God's given you or whatever favor God's put upon you is a grace of God, but it's not undeserved, unmerited favor that no matter what you do, it's going to work. You, there are things you're going to have to do in the body of Christ to work it. And we'll go along with Paul here, and we'll find out. That he, he says some things in these other chapters <clears throat> that we won't get to tonight. In all the chapters that we won't get to tonight. You'd think by the time you're my age, my voice would stop cracking. Wherefore he saith, when he led up, when he when he ascended up on high, he gave he led captivity. <laughs> when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now, what's he what's he moving into here? He's talked about the body of Christ, and now he's going to move in transition to this part of the chapter on ministry grace or ministry gifts, ministry endowments. He gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended and is. Uh, what is it that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far by all, all of heavens that he might fill all things. Now, 9 and 10, I mean, uh, verse 9 is, and 10 is kind of a, just a side thought, and then he comes back, okay? So it, it's just it's a side thought, and that's why it's in brackets, because Paul kind of diverted from what he was trying to say. So I'm going to leave out 9 and 10 so we can connect with the thought, okay? It's not changing the Bible. It is there. It's in the Bible. But it's a side thought to his, what he's teaching here, okay? So it's, it's kind of like, you know, we're coming along, I'm teaching. I say, oh, and by the way, and I say something, and then I come back to what I'm saying. It's not that what I said wasn't important, wasn't imperative, or not needed. It was, it's not in the train of thought that I was saying when I, oh, by the way, this, and then I come back. So this is kind of Paul going, um, he gave gifts unto men. Oh, and by the way, he that ascended, what is it that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended also is the same also that ascended up far above all the heavens. And now, now let's get back to what I was saying. Because that's kind of what that was. It's, it's Bible. It's canon. It's, it's scripture. God wanted him to say it. But it's, it's not in the chain of thought of what he was trying to say. He gave gifts unto men. And he gave some. See, this is the gifts he's talking about. He gave some apostles and some prophets. Now, let me say this. That word, you know, we're talking about he gave gifts unto men, which is a different word. It's not grace. It's a different word. But he's talking about his grace. You know, he gave a grace according to the gifts that he gave. Okay? He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting. The word perfecting here really is better translated maturing. Are developing for the maturing or developing of the saints for the work of the ministry. God wants the saints in the body of Christ matured for the work of the ministry. The past, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher are given for your benefit to mature you. Now we have taken. You know, I, sometimes I feel like I've shoot myself in the foot. I mean, I'd love to have somebody come and give me, you know, $50,000 or a Rolls Royce or just hand me the keys to a car and, you know, go, go, go buy the pastor a house and I just walk into it debt-free. That'd be lovely, you know? But we have taught things under the guise of biblical prosperity that are erroneous. We've taught things to people that you've got to give up. You've got to take care of your man of God. Let me say something. I am not your man of God. I'm the pastor of the church you attend. I'm your, I am the shepherd. In that sense, yes, but I am not like your go-between between God. If you don't have me, you can't contact God. That's not where my role is. That is, that is the church at Rome's thinking that's filtered over. Kind of got, it's been kind of resurrected in some circles. You know, the man of God. Did you know Jesus says something very interesting? When he came to Peter to wash Peter's feet, Peter said, not so, Lord. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part in me. For the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister. Preachers, I don't care who, what, what office you stand in. If you've got the very highest, most bishopess. I mean, we've got all these titles. We've got some titles out there. You think, where in the world? The vice bishop or something. I mean, you know, you've got all kinds of titles that aren't in the Bible. Okay, we got the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, and bishop is a, is a biblical term, but not vice bishop, and not the royal bishop, and not the most high bishop, and all this kind of stuff. 
We don't have those. Those are not biblical terms. I just like to say with Bible terms. Amen. I like to say with stuff that's in the Bible. I don't like to pick up stuff and use a worldly method. I want to just start calling those vice admirals or rear admirals or whatever, you know. Jesus. Hallelujah. We've got to get back to understanding that ministers are the gift given to the body of Christ to help them grow. We are not here so you can come serve us like we're kings. I, don't, I understand there's, there's biblical principles, and I don't want to run over that, but we don't need to get out of an, an error over something the Bible doesn't teach. Okay? I mean, it goes so far. There are churches, I mean, I have people in church, so they, they've been in churches where women in the church go have sex with the pastor because they are sent by God to take care of his physical needs, and I say, you have got to stink and be kidding. Are you kidding me? And they do it believing they're, they're doing a service to the pastor because he's the man of God. Well, the man of God needs to keep his body in check. Hello? You're not sent to have sex with the pastor unless you are his wife. One. Uno. That's not, you can't, there's no calling to that. So you see, you get out of balance. And so what we've done, we have been given as gifts to men and women. And it's, it's proper. Listen, we, we start teaching some of these things because such of a lack of respect and honor for ministry. Yes, you know, give honor to those who labor in word and deed, you know, to, to, to the elders. Uh, double honor, especially to those who labor in word and deed. We're to, uh, see, there's a difference between honor and man worship. You can get out of balance with honor. Honoring means you respect them. You don't, you don't treat them like with disdain. You don't treat them wrongly. You treat them with respect. But you don't have sex with the pastor because you're trying to take care of him so he can preach. I mean, that's enough to make you throw up in church. Yeah. Or this, you know, treating him like, you know, his excellency and the royal this and the royal, you know. Give me a stinking break. I am, the, Bible does not, the Bible nowhere refers to any of the ministry gifts as his excellency or the royal highness or the queen or king of this and the children as the prince of the city and all that. That's just man stuff. Okay? And then ministers get caught up in this narcissistic God mind in this and forget their role that they were giving as a gift to mature the saints. To bring them up in Christ to develop them so that they can go out and do their part in the work of the ministry to reach the lost and to bring people into the kingdom of God. When I leave here tonight, I will probably do what you do. Go somewhere and get something to eat. Whether I go home and cook a grilled cheese sandwich or run by Popeye's and get me some fried chicken and red beans and rice. Uh, hallelujah. We just got a new Popeye's on High Point Road. It just opened. Hallelujah. Eat up, 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 up. Amen. I might run by cookout and get me a chocolate milkshake. You know? So, we need to understand that even our calling is a, is a gift to men. We're, we're, you know, without it, we can't, we're, not, we're not supposed to be doing this if we're not called to do it. Not because we're eloquent speakers, which I'm not. I know that. Hallelujah. So he gave some apostles, some prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting or maturing of the saints. What? For the work of the ministry. Our gifting ministers, your gifting is for the purpose of developing the saints so they can go do the work of the ministry. Not so they can serve you like you're king of kings and lord of lords. You don't live in Buckingham Palace or, or, or the Versailles Castle or whatever. You know, you got all your servants waiting on you. You don't want the Versailles Castle outcome anyway. Louis and Marie got their heads cut off at Place de la Concorde. The place of reconciliation. It's called that now. It's not, that's not what it was called when they did it. They took them to what is now called the Place de la Concorde and cut their heads off. So just remember, all them folks serving you will cut your head off. All right. How long are we supposed to do this? And so, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith, of the faith, not of the, of the unity of doctrine. We're not going to get everybody, in, you know, listen, there are going to be people in the Baptist church who will never believe speaking in tongues and miracles are for the church today, and you're going to have Pentecostals who will always believe that it is, and they will always argue over it. 
But they, all, they both believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They both believe that the blood of Jesus is vicarious. They both believe that the blood of Jesus and faith in Jesus Christ and his redemptive work is the only way to be born again. That's the unity of the faith. There's going to be doctrinal points we're not going to agree on. There's going to be Pentecostals who don't agree in prosperity and Pentecostals who do. Hello? But we all, we all believe that confessing Jesus is Lord and, and believe that God raises from the dead, you'll be saved. We believe that you should be water baptized. You know, I mean, there's things that we do believe that we're always going to be in unity about. There's going to be other things we're not going to be. That doesn't mean that if everybody's going to We're going to have people who never come to agree on certain things. But there's things they have to agree on. There is no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved that at the name of Jesus. So you have to be saved through Jesus Christ. Those are the things we ha that we, have to, we will be in unity on. And be unity of the faith. Okay? There's a faith that saves us. And there's a faith in Jesus. Glory to God. I've got Baptist friends who don't believe things along the, the, the lines of, of um, signs, wonders, miracles, baptism, the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. But they're good people. Pastors I know love the Lord, preach good, solid uh, messages, uh, not about the Holy Ghost along those lines, but other, other things that preach good message on marriage, on, on getting saved, you know, on living right. They preach, you know, they love the Lord, you know. And uh, just because we don't agree on other things doesn't mean they're not saved. They are not going to, they're going to heaven just as fast as I am. All right. They love the Lord just as much as I love the Lord. And just because we don't agree on that don't mean that they're not saved. Amen. And they can probably look in just because he believes that doesn't mean he's not saved. <laughs> And he's, he believes that tongue talking. I don't believe that's of God, but you know, he, I think he'll still make heaven. Hallelujah. Till we all come to the unity and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a mature man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now here, verse 14, that we be henceforth no more children. Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to the sea. Let me say something here. Now I, I, have, I grew up Pentecostal. Classical Pentecost. I grew up in a classical Pentecostal denomination. Then when I, you know, I got born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, spoke with other tongues. And then I got a hold of um, some teachings by Dad Hagen and, and ended up over in the Word of Faith charismatic movement. So I've been in that, you know, and that's kind of where I still am, you know. And, and uh, you know what? Us charismatics are the world's worst for moving with every wind of doctrine. Oh, my God. I'm just telling you, to have the Holy Ghost and have all that revelation and some squirrely thing come down the pipe and it takes us two, three, four years to undo what everybody jumped into. Example, back in the late 80s, there was a person running around in meetings and I'm telling you some of the top biggest charismatic leaders in the country were having this person in their, on their platforms or in their churches to demonstrate the blood and the oil coming down the palms of their hand and the feathers dropping out of their things. And they'd go, feathers from heaven, feathers from heaven. And, fe and, they, and all this money, 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 that crazy oil on the palm of her hand. It was supposed to represent the anointing of the Holy Ghost, blood on the palm of her hand, you know, that Jesus was manifest in the building. Now, I must be one of the weird charismatic Pentecostals. That stuff always bugged me. I was always like, that ain't right. And people say, who are you to judge? You know, so-and-so accepts and so-and-so accepts in big names. Until somebody went with a high-speed video camera and recorded her in a service. Then went back to their studio and played it back at slow, slow speed. It was all stuffed up in her shirt. It was all fake. But people just throwing money, throwing money, throwing money. About this miracle act of the sign of God. I mean, name, big name people. If I name them, you'd fall out of your seat. Had them in their churches on their platforms. And it's, demo it's really witchcraft. You know, you're demonic and, 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 and seducing the people. Got exposed, killed the, killed the ministry. Of course it did. It wasn't a ministry. It was a deception that was taking money. Was it? it was sucking money. out, And we, we will throw money at crazy stuff. Now I'm talking about myself. We're charismatics. We're crazy matics sometimes. We're supposed to grow up and not be tossed to and fro. Now, some of y'all remember a few years ago, this, this pe people came out of Brazil and with gold dust on Bibles. They'd be preaching and gold dust would appear on Bibles. And then they'd take up an offering. And all I wanted to know was, why do you need an offering? Just get some gold dust. Take a, collect the gold dust. It was all a sham. That person died, by the way, 
early. God's, and see, people will take and throw money, hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of, will come out of the body of Christ into these pools of these things of winds of doctrine. Now we had the latest news, wind of doctrine is a radical grace teaching. I'm sorry, I went too fast for that. The newest, latest, greatest wind of doctrine is the radical grace teaching. And everybody's gone crazy over it the past five or six years. Hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars have been poured into certain ministries that teach along this line. Now you're starting to find out after a few years of this going on in the church, we got all kinds of junk going on in the church that wasn't going on before. Fornication. Fornication. Homosexuality is coming to the church. Adultery. Lying, stealing. All kinds of junk's coming to the church. And everybody just goes, I'm under grace. And what's happening? Winds of doctrine always suck finances out of the church and pull them into the hands of those who teach false messages or winds of doctrines. The Bible actually says they lie in wait to deceive. They were to grow up. We're not even moving. Somebody, I mean, I remember a number of years ago, somebody was teaching on something called the Mary Most. And I, I forgot what it meant. But, you know, and now everybody was talking about, do you remember, do, are you, do you know about the Mary Most? And they, it, was a, it was a Greek word. And they were so caught up with that, and, you know, they felt like they were some spiritual hotshot because they could tell you the word Mary Most. And they were all running around acting crazy over it. And, and it's like, okay, you got a Greek word. What does it mean? What good is that doing you? You know, we, we do things like this. Somebody says they went to heaven. We'll go buy their tapes. You know, you, you listen to four different people who've been to heaven, listen to their tapes, and none of them match. I hadn't found one yet that lines up with the other one. One guy said it took him seven days to get there and seven days to get back. And he was there a week. 21 days he was gone in the spirit, supposedly. And people buying his tape series, $400 a tape series or something about his story on the one to heaven. We are not to be tossed to and fro. Pastor Hagen, Kenneth, Kenneth W. Hagen, Dad, Dad Hagen's son, pastors Raymond Bible Church, overseas Raymond Bible Training Center, always made this statement. He says, do not miss the supernatural looking for the spectacular. See, winds of doctrine will present a spectacular that oftentimes will supplant the supernatural. We get caught up in that and miss what God's really trying to do. Because it's, it's exciting. How many, remember, how, how many remember stuffing money in the preacher's pockets? I was in a meeting one time. And I'll I tell you, I'll be honest with you, I got disgusted. And I respected every ministry there. But I got disgusted. Because one guy came out one day with, a, with like a running windsuit coat on with elastic and zipped up part of the way so that people, when they start stuffing money, it didn't fall out on the floor, it just stayed inside his coat. And people coming up the whole time he's preaching, just shoving 20s and 100s and all this kind of stuff in there until he's filled up with money. And the teaching was you have to give up to the higher anointing to get blessed. Really? Jesus said to lend to the poor, the Lord will repay you. You know, one guy said he was sitting in a, in, a, in a prosperity meeting, sitting on the end of the road. Didn't even preach that week, and people came by and gave him $25,000 that week. Why? Because you presented that. You, see, these are winds of doctrine that people fall for. And what usually ends up happening, now, well, that's, <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm stuck over here. I'm trying to get finished up, but I'm, I'm going to have to stay here. These are the very things that bring a reproach on the body of Christ. You can't go explain it. Oh, yeah, well, that's God. I tell you, that's God. I know it's God because I gave and I got $100 back. Now, here's my, here's my statement. If, it won't, if, it, if, it, if it'll work for the preacher in the row and it won't work for the guy at the back on the back row, then it's not God. Because God's principles and God's laws work for everybody. And I don't believe in giving, I don't believe there's a, there are higher anointings. You understand what I'm saying? I do not believe the Bible teaches 
that because I'm a pastor, I have a higher anointing than you do. No, I'm anointing for the office I stand in. But the, Jesus, in talking about, Paul, in talking about the body of Christ, talked about the comely parts and the other parts. And basically was saying that, you know, that the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee. So the Bible does not teach higher anointing. The Bible teaches that we are all part of the same body. Now, I may be anointed to pastor, which, and you're not, that doesn't mean my anointing is higher. It just means I'm anointed to do what I do. You may be anointed to soul, go out on the streets and soul win like crazy. That may be your calling and your anointing. It doesn't mean that you're higher than the person who's anointed to watch the children in the nursery. There are not, quote, higher anointings so you can give up, so you can get blessed. That, that is so self-servant. Think about it now. I preach as the pastor. I won't get up and say, now, in order for you to be blessed, you've got to give to the higher anointing. I'm the higher anointing, so give me the $10,000. And you're going to get your hundredfold return. And you whip out your wallet and you write your check or you come up and stuff money in my coat pocket down in my, you know, I'll throw it all over the floor and all this kind of stuff. And we, woo, praise God, they're given to the higher anointing. No. There's only one anointing that's higher, and that's the anointing of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. When we give to the Lord, and whether we're given to the Lord, we're told by him to give to Penny or to Jessica or to Brother Bill, or to give to the pastor. Whatever God tells us to do, we're giving in accordance with what he told us to. And that works. But this other stuff is out of balance with the word of God. Now, I know these guys will get mad with me and say, you know, they'll say, he's wrong. Blah, blah, blah. I, I'm hogwash. I believe in, you know, now the, when the Bible talks about giving to those, that don't, tr don't muzzle the oxen that treadeth out the corn. The labor's worthy of his hire. What was that? Notice the labor was worthy of his hire. When he ministered the word of God, it was right for you to give them of your natural means to support them as they minister to your spiritual need. But that was not this giving to the higher anointing so you can get a big return. That was not muzzling the oxen. That was taking care of them financially because they were taking care of you spiritually. That was a biblical principle within proper perspective, not out of balance perspective that, you know, well, Ed Taylor's a pastor. He has a higher anointing. If I give to him, I get a special return. No. Why do you get blessed by not muzzling out the oxen? Because you're out walking in obedience to the word of God, not because you're given to a higher anointing. Do you all understand? These are the things that we're taught. Now, Dad Hagen sat there in, in 1998, 1999, the year before the book, The Midas Touch, was released. He called them all to his office. Actually, had a big conference in the conference table there at, at Rama. He called all the prosperity preachers. And not, now, not all of them came. Some of them said, I, the Lord told me not to go. It hurt my faith. No. You didn't want to hear the correction that the man of God had for you that you called your spiritual father, that you imitated all over the country. You stood on platforms and went, everybody knows who my spiritual father is. Twiddled the thumbs, hung the feet off the platform, and did, did the bounce like Brother Hagin would do sometimes when he would get, you know, like that. He called him his spiritual father, and then he said, I need to talk to you about, about prosperity. The Lord told me not to come. <laughs> you don't claim and ride the piggyback of the ministry's name and then when they say you need to be corrected because you're out of excess that the Lord told you not to come. No, you do it. Mess up what you're teaching. And it did. I said it did. But he, probably, he called them all in, sat them down, and, and he had a notebook sitting there. I, I know because I knew somebody was in the meeting. <laughs> I, I, I personally know somebody was there. They told me. They, they were there, and they told me what happened. He had, he had, he had some, a notebook with notes in it. And he looked at all of them, and he said this. He said, listen. None of you are teaching anything new. As a matter of fact, they were teaching the same thing back in the 1950s at the end of the, what they called the latter rain movement. He said, I had the notes right here from sitting in the meetings. He said it killed the move of God because they got into excess and, uh, and, 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 and over whatever and, and teaching on prosperity, and it killed the move of God. And he said, I brought, I brought you here because I'm determined not to let that happen again. And a lot of people there rejected what he's saying, what he said. And we saw what happened. God was doing some things, and it, it sidetracked some things. And now we, we, we've had, basically we're having a kind of a split in the church between those who want to walk after the Spirit and those who want to walk in the flesh. It's taking place in the church. What do you mean those who want to walk in the flesh? We have churches accepting gay marriage as normal, putting it into their doctrine that, you know, or into their, their, their constitution. Presbyterian USA just changed their constitution to say that the same-sex couples can get married. And you know what happened when they did that? The Spirit of God came down, and over this Presbyterian USA, the word Ichabod was written. 
which means the Spirit of God has departed. <laughs> yes, it did. I don't believe, I don't care what you believe. But we, we're, 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 having, we're, we're teaching things. And so now we got, I, I know people. See, if we, if, we, if we learn not to be tossed, that's why the Bible says don't be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Because you don't see what's going to happen five years down the road when this is being taught. You just see the excitement of the moment. I'm going to give him that offer, and I'm going to get a hundredfold. I'm going to give him $5, I'm going to get $500 back. I'm going to get $5,000, I'm going to get $500,000. Woo, glory to God. People are calculating up there. I mean, they're buying their yachts. Sitting in their seat, buying their yachts in their head because they're going to give a certain amount and get this big return. Now, one guy was really a hot shot in the prosperity teaching back when it first really was really hot, hot. Everybody was into the super prosperity. I went to Raymond with this guy. We graduated together. His family was a good family. I knew his worship leader at his church. Became, we've become good friends over the years. And this guy got to teaching prosperity with a group running around. They got off in the air. Well, the next thing you know, finally he's beat his wife and they're divorced. Then he's married somebody else and there's all kind of drinking and stuff going on. He divorces her. Married somebody else. Now their church down in, 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 the, in the sunshine state. Sunshine. Having come as bare as you dare spring break parties for the youth. It's the youth outreach. And then they're doing paintings and hanging them on the wall. Basically porn. So bad that the city came and took their tax-exempt status away from them because they were not operating as a church. They were operating as a what? Yeah, they, were charging, they were charging people coming basically for a nightclub. They were running a nightclub. Now, this guy was a Rhema graduate. I knew him. Was solid to start with. Got caught up in this and got into excess. That's why we're not going to be tossed to and fro. Because you look later down the road and you see, oh, my God, if we had known this when it happened, that's why we are to be sound doctrinally. We are to receive the word of God with all readiness in mind, but we are to search the scriptures to see whether those things be so or not. And we're to prove it out. But I am telling you, that's why I said about the charismatic Pentecostal, charis it was particularly the charismatic word of faith people. And I'm in that group, so don't say you're, you're banging us. I am talking about the people I know and, 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 and I've been around. I'm not, I'm not pushing down so, you know, an outside group. I'm in the middle of them. Okay? But the fact of the matter is, if we don't stay sound and don't get tossed to and fro, if, we, if we're getting tossed to and fro, we're going to get moved about by every wind of doctrine, and we're going to get messed up, and we're going to hurt people in the process. You're going to run people out of the church who will never darken the doors again because of what they experience and those kind of things. Plus, the untold amounts of money that was taken out of the preaching of the true gospel and siphoned off on the lascivious lifestyle of those who lied and wait to deceive or laid and wait to deceive and deceive great portions of the body of Christ. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Y'all can't get, if y'all get, get any more excited, I just don't know if I can handle myself. Amen. How far did I get? Oh, but <laughs> we'll pick up next week with 15. I can't go any further. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. But you understand the importance of not being tossed to and fro? And that is why pastors, you, you ministers that stand in front of people, you can't do stuff um, and everything be about you trying to figure out how to get more money out of the people for you. Now, listen, I, I believe we got, there's things to get money out, get money out of people. There are, there, are, there are right things to do to, for the people to give to to support the work of the ministry. But it is not so you can figure out how to get a bigger, uh, more fancier car or your own whatever so you can fly all over the place. It is about advancing the kingdom. If you need a good car to advance the kingdom, I get that. But it does not have to be a million-dollar Lamborghini 
Well, the Lord blessed me with this. Sometimes I find it hard when the ministers are going out and they're, they're writing books and they're selling tapes and they're selling this and they're selling that. And people, they, they got partners all over the country. They go in churches all over the country, get partners in every church all over the place. And they got all this money coming in and they're driving around in, you know, in a car that not, no pastor could get unless they have some kind of mega church where they're, they're, they're still flying around doing everything. Uh, could even think about getting. Well, I, God called me to, you, know, well, you don't have to have a Lamborghini to go from church to church. Hello? That little Fiat 500 work just now. Just <laughs> it gets 40 miles to the gallon. You know, stuff your suitcase in the back of that thing. I, I get it in Shannon's and I got to lay it back just so my head doesn't hit the ceiling. You know, I'm like, Shannon, I love your car. It's a pregnant roller skate. She loves it. That's fine. I, that's it. See, we, 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 if you're not careful, then we'll come back and get in the other dish. We can't have anything. God don't want you to you know. We're not going to give you anything. And we're not, that's not what we're trying to do. What we're trying to say is, when we get with doctrine, we start teaching. You got to give to the higher anointing. You give the man, the man of God lots and lots and lots of money is going to cause him to be able to minister better to your life. The truth of the matter is, we have to trust the anointing on him to minister because we're trusting the Holy Ghost, not the man anyway. I think the I think ministers should be taken care of. The Bible teaches that. But that wind of doctrine that where we start elevating them to a place of, of a, almost a narcissistic God and we worship them like a God is out of line with the word of God. And so we have to be careful about these things and make sure we stay balanced. Amen. We trust that you were blessed by the word of God and the flow of the spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the giving online button. Thank you and may God richly bless you for your giving.